Well, if you've never learned Latin, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The term Passover in Hebrew is Pesach. Not originally a Hebrew term. It comes from the Greek word Pesh, meaning to spread wings over as in to protect. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus describes himself or compares himself to a mother hen taking care of her chick protectively. The Bible, when you see the language of spreading wings over, it always has to do with this. He spreads his wings over those he protects. We call it the thief of first fruits. That's the resurrection. We call it Hag Matzot, the thief of unleavened bread. We call it Pesach, Passover. All occurs in that seven week, seven day period of time. In the synagogues to this day, the Song of Solomon is being read. Let's look at the Song of Solomon, Hashira Shirim, chapter 3. The Song of Solomon in Hebrew, we know from the gender and number what the bride is singing, what the bridegroom is, is singing, and what the witnesses to the relationship are singing by the gender and number in the Hebrew text. The bride representing the bride of the Messiah, the bridegroom representing the Messiah, and the Tzavaot, the witnesses in heaven, or the host of heaven who witness the relationship, the marriage. It points to the marriage supper of the Lamb in chapter 2, the banquet hall with his banner over me is love, the Jewish wedding with the hoopah, and so on. But in chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, <clears throat> On my bed, night after night, I saw him whom I so loved. I saw him, says the bride, but did not find him. I must arise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I must seek him whom I so loved. I saw him, but I didn't find him. The watchmen who make the rounds of the city found me, like the police, and said, Have you seen him whom I so loves? I asked them. Scarcely had I left them when I found him whom I so loved. I held on to him and would not let him go until I brought him to my mother's house and into the room of her who conceived me. And then it goes into this refrain, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you will not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Until she pleases. No man in his right mind wants a woman who doesn't want him. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's not waiting for no reason. We think we're waiting for him to come back. He is waiting for us to be ready for him to come back. What does he say? When the crop permits, he sends the harvest. One of the reasons the return of Christ is a variable, even though God knows when it is, is because it doesn't only depend on him. In his grace and in his mercy, he wants the bride to be ready. And he wants as many people as possible to be saved. Second Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow about keeping his promise, but wanting none to perish, but all should come to repentance. He tarries that more may be saved and that the bride may be ready. Now in chapter 3, the bride is ready for the bridegroom to come. We say Nisan, the month of Hebrew, is the month of redemption. But in chapter 5, this is what we find. The Song of Solomon is built on two dreams. It's sort of like an Arashio, like Handel's Messiah, or it's like uh, the Resurrectione by Handel. 
The bride sings, the bridegroom sings in a duet, and then there's the chorus sung by the witnesses. But the whole story hinges on these two dreams. The second dream is in chapter 5. I've come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I've eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I've drunk my wine and, and my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and imbibe deeply, O lovers. Now the gender changes. The bride begins. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved, was knocking open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night. I've taken off my dress, how can I put them on again? I've washed my feet, how can I dirty them again? My beloved extended his hand to the opening. My feelings were aroused for him. I arose to open my beloved and my hands dripped with mirth and my fingers with liquid mirth. On the handles of the boat, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and had gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The watchmen who make the round, the watchmen were in the first dream as well, found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my soul, and then there's the reason. In chapter 3, the bride is ready for the bridegroom. It's her best dream. She goes out. She's out of bed. She's all dressed. She's all ready. She finds the watchman. Where is he? And she goes to be with the bridegroom. Think of a wedding day. When, some, when a young girl is going to get married, her whole focus becomes her wedding day. That's what she's thinking about for the, for the weeks and the months preceding it. However, that's her best dream. Chapter 5 becomes her worst nightmare. And it speaks of Mer. Mer only had one purpose in the ancient Near East, to anoint bodies for burial. For instance, in chapter 4, what do we read? Verse 6. Until the cool of day, when the shadows flee away, I, that is the bridegroom, will go my way to the mountain of Mary, to the hill of frankincense. Frankincense is an offering. Myrrh is anointing for burial. Jesus goes to the mountain of Mary. He goes to Calvary to die for his bride. What does Paul say? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? His bride, he died for her. He gave his life for her. That's how husbands are supposed to love their wives. Now, In chapter 3, it's her best dream. She's all ready. She's out of bed. The bridegroom comes, and she's off with him. In chapter 5, it's her worst nightmare. She's expecting him, sort of. She's in some way expecting him to come. But when he comes, she doesn't want to get out of bed. I've taken off my dress. This is like the wedding garment. How can I put it on again? He knocks. Oh, what a time for you to come. He doesn't want to get out of the bed. Oh, all right. She gets out of bed, puts on her wedding dress, because the feelings are aroused for him, but then he is gone. And she runs out and can't find him. Only when she opens the door, now the myrrh is on her finger. She's anointed for burial. She goes out into the streets, and in her best dream, she asks the watchman, the police, where is he? In her worst nightmare, she asks the police, where is he? And they wound her. They persecute her. She misses the bridegroom. This is what's read in the synagogue of Passover. At Passover in Matthew 25, Jesus explains it. The wise and foolish virgin. The wise ones are ready for the Messiah to come. The foolish are not. They miss him. 
In both cases, they were in some way expecting him. But if the return of Christ is not chief among our goals and objectives, it's not the thing we're most longing for, we're not going to be ready. It's either the best dream of chapter 3 or the worst nightmare of chapter 5. When Jesus comes, it'll either be our best dream or our worst nightmare. For every Christian, or for every church, that's what the women are like. Remember, women are always figures of, of, of churches. Good women represent good churches. Bad women correspond to things like the woman Jezebel, the spirit of false religion in Revelation. But let's look at the perfect bride. Proverbs 31. One of her characteristics in verse 18 is her lamp does not go out at night. Whose lamp does not go out at night? The perfect bride. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The oil in the lamps, like the old time Pentecostals would sing, give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, Passover song. Is the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Darkness increases in the last days. The Bible repeatedly refers to the great tribulation by the metaphor of the night. He's coming like a thief in the night. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? He's coming like a, 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 he's coming in the second watch of the night or the third. Um, work while you have the light, but night will come when no man can work. Darkness will increase. A little bit of light will go a long way. But when it gets pitch dark, you need some good light. At a time when spiritual deception is increasing, at a time when we need to have the most oil in our lamp to see things scripturally, we see the opposite happening. We see wise virgins and foolish virgins. I got a letter from the Elam pastor in Harrow, and he says, just because something's not biblical doesn't mean it's unbiblical. Posters and microwave ovens aren't in the Bible, and they're not wrong. I said, but they're not doctrines. First Corinthians chapter 4 says, do not exceed the things which are written. You can't base a doctrine on something not biblical. He said, the only way to determine if what's happening in Toronto is of God is, is the fruit. People having the marriages put back together, he says, were happening. And people having a greater fervency. And I said, the first and foremost test is does it agree with the word of God? I can introduce you to Mormons who will tell you their marriage was put back together and have a greater fervency because of becoming Mormon. There's always real cheese in the rat trap. Do not exceed the things that are written, Paul says. Leviticus 10 calls it offering strange fire. God smote those people, not because they did something the Bible didn't say, said not to do, but because they did something that the Bible didn't say to do. Another person I know was criticized by his church for putting things under the microscope to examine them scripturally. They said, you're putting things under the microscope. Rodney Brown tells people, as we'll look at in the next session, don't try to analyze it or understand it, just accept it. The people who are going to be the foolish virgins are the ones who are not going to have the illumination of the Holy Spirit in their understanding of Scripture. Experiential theology is death. People who build their doctrines and their theologies on experience are exceeding the things which are written. Even if something is true, if it's not in the Bible, you can't base a doctrinal position on it. Why has the charismatic movement failed, as we talked about? It's been here 27 years, and it's not brought revival, and the churches are worse off now than they were before the The first characteristic is undoubtedly experiential theology. Exceeding the things which are written. At Passover, we learn a lot about the return of Christ. One thing we'll need for him to come back is oil in our lamp. It is a time when the people who are going to be ready for the bridegroom to come are going to be getting more oil in their lamp, more understanding of God's word. In the last days, faithfulness 
and understanding become very closely associated. Like Laodicea needed oil in its lamp. Uh, Laodicea needed salt to anoint its eyes that it may see. Laodicea doesn't know it's Laodicea. It's blind. It doesn't know its true spiritual state. You don't know that you're wretched, kid, evil, poor, blind, and naked. They think because they're materially well off, they're spiritually well off, but the opposite was true. The people who are going into this, who are not getting into the Bible deeper, but are basing their doctrines on all this hype and nonsense, those people are going to be the foolish virgins. Those churches will be the foolish virgins. The people who plunge deeper into God's word are going to be the wise virgins. That's the beginning of Passover. That's what happened when the bridegroom came the first time. Most Jews weren't ready. Why did Jesus say they weren't ready? Because you're not understanding the scriptures or the power of God. That's why they weren't ready. They didn't understand the scriptures or the power of God. Why are Christians, so many of them, and so many churches not going to be ready? They don't understand the scriptures or the power of God. The power of God is a power unto salvation, we're told. I've got a whole file of articles by reporters from secular newspapers that have come to churches like Holy Trinity Brompton to see the Toronto thing. And they all mock it and laugh at it. One reporter comes and she gets played in the spirit she wasn't even a Christian, neither did she become one. When the real Pentecostal fire fell, unsaved people fell under the power of God, were convicted, repented, and were saved. These people don't know the power of God. You think hopping around like this and laughing like a baboon is the power of God. That's not the power of God. But they don't understand the power of God or the scriptures. So the Jews were not ready for the first Passover. Christians who make the same mistake are not going to be ready for the second Passover. Let me explain. In the Passover, Jews always looked back to the redemption out of Egypt, but they looked forward to the coming redemption of the Messiah. The same month, the same time of year when Jesus, when God delivered them from Egypt is when Jesus came to deliver them from sin. They look back and they look forward. For believers, it's the same thing. When we take the Lord's Supper, which comes from Passover, we look back to what Jesus did for us on the cross, but we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Jews are looking back what he did the first time, but looking forward to what he's going to do. We're looking back to what he did the first time, but looking forward. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, it should be an appetizer, a little foretaste of what the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the Song of Solomon and Revelation 19 and so on are going to be like. Now, the preparation for the Pesach and the times of Jesus work like this. They would begin by cleaning everything. Our custom of spring cleaning goes back to biblical times. The Sanhedrin would be responsible for cleansing all leaven out of the temple, anything containing yeast from it. To this day, Jewish families do the same thing. If they're observant, they remove anything containing yeast out of the house. What is yeast or leaven? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 7. Let's begin in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For the Messiah, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven has to do with sin. To 
To this day, in the Middle East, Oriental Jewish women, Sephardic Jewish women, Yemenite Jewish women, and Arab women will make bread by a sourdough method. Before they bake the dough, they'll take a lump of dough out of it and use it as the base in the batter of the next loaf. And before they bake that, take a lump from that and put it into the batter of the next. Biologically, yeast spores multiply very quickly. So does thin. It goes from generation to generation. Secondly, the kind of thin that is underlies other kinds of thin is pride. When you see somebody with a greed problem, their underlying problem underneath the greed is usually pride. When you see somebody with a lust problem, underneath the lust problem usually lays the sin of vanity, pride. Puffed up. But thirdly is the sin of false doctrine. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of false doctrine will bring death. Just a little bit. False doctrine is sin, if it's persisted in. They may not know it's sin. It may be a sin of ignorance, but it's sin. Secondly, it puffs up the people who teach error are people with pride problems. We'll look at that in the next section. Question. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The New Testament contains twice as much exhortation to right doctrine as it does right conduct. It contains twice as much exhortation to right doctrine as it does right conduct. Why? Because if you don't know what right doctrine is, you won't know what right conduct is. You'll have born-again Roman Catholics praying in tongues to Mary, committing idolatry. The Holy Spirit is not the spirit of error. He's the spirit of truth. And the Holy Spirit, Tarawak HaKodesh, means the spirit of holiness. He's not the spirit of sin. When you have somebody praying to the dead, kneeling down before a statue, in Hebrew, the word to worship and to genuflect, bow down is the same word, hishtachavot, lighting a candle to Mary and praying to somebody, other than God, this is idolatry. To say it's okay to stay in the Roman Catholic Church as long as you're baptized in the Spirit, that's like saying the Holy Spirit led me to sin. They say, well, they have to stay in to reach Catholics. Well, listen, would you tell an alcoholic who gets saved to keep drinking so he could win, win other drunks to Christ? Would you tell a drug addict who gets saved to keep shooting heroin so he can reach other junkies? Would you tell a prostitute who gets saved to keep working the streets so she could reach other hookers? Of course you would. When you tell somebody to stay in the Roman Catholic Church, you're doing the same thing. Idolatry. You cannot practice that religion without sinning. Leaven. The leaven must go. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It must go. Spiritual seduction increases in the last days. If possible, the elect will be deceived. The Antichrist will be manifested. And what do you see? Spiritual seduction. Purge the leaven. Jewish families begin the Passover after the spring cleaning, all the leaven's been taken out of the house. But your wife will normally leave a little bit of leaven, usually a bit of biscuit, and hide it, and you play a game with your children. Now, Passover is not just a meal. It involves storytelling, reading from the Bible. It involves children's games. It involves songs. It involves a lot of things. Prayers, etc., but it begins with the Bedi Chab Chamet, the search for leaven. The reference is in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. I will search Jerusalem with lamps. In other words, I'll look for false doctrine, leaven, with right teaching. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the body is sound, the eye is sound, the body will be sound also. All the members of the body. The lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. Right? Uh, therefore, shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace, feet of evangelists. But eyes are the lamp of the body. They give the light to the body. Thy words are lamps to my feet, they're teachers. God will search Jerusalem, search the church with right teaching to expose falsehood. 
Now, of course, this means something for the Jews specifically. We don't believe in any form of replacement theology, but we do believe in incorporation. It applies to the church, even though it's about the Jews. Let's go further. Your wife has left a little bit of biscuit. So you take the lamp, like in Zechariah 1.12. You use a candle now, not an actual lamp. You bring this wooden spoon and you bring a feather. And you play a game with the children and they get a reward when they find the leaven that's been left. And they put it on with the feather onto the wooden spoon. And then your whole family takes it outside the house. You wrap it in paper and you burn it. You burn the leaven and you say a prayer. May this and all the leaven we've not found be purged, be considered null and void. Before the Jews were to take the Passover, they had to purge the leaven. Before we come to the Lord's table and take the Lord's Supper, there should be a time for repentance, to confess our sins to the Lord, get rid of the leaven. It was, as we looked at in the first session, a pilgrim feast. And Isaiah, we read, go through the streets, clear the roads. The Sanhedrin were responsible for clearing the roads because the pilgrims would come. Now, they'd have a number of responsibilities, one of which was Jerusalem was like Blackpool. It didn't have a lot of people in its indigenous population, maybe about 120,000 in the days of Jesus. But because it was a pilgrim feast, during the pilgrim feast, like Passover, the population would swell with pilgrims, tourists who came for the feast. So much of the local trade, inns and things like this, depended on people coming for these holiday seasons, these holy days, similar to Blackpool. On the way, people would stay in tombs. Jews prepared burial places before they died. However, if a Jew came in even indirect contact with a corpse, a dead body, he, they were considered to be ritually unclean. They couldn't celebrate the Passover. So the Sanhedrin would be responsible to see that any tomb that had a body buried in it would be whitewashed at Passover. And it's this that Jesus uses. If it had whitewash on it, you had to keep away from it because it was filled with dead men's bones. If it was not whitewashed, you could sleep in it. So at Passover time, Jesus says, What are you, scribes and Pharisees? You like whitewashed too? You look nice and white on the outside, painted with this white limestone we have in the Middle East, but inside you're filled with dead men's bones. That's what he's doing. Similarly, it was a time when marriages were arranged. When marriages were arranged. It was considered to be particularly beneficial to marry a Bat Zion, a daughter of Zion. Don't believe when I married one, but that's another story. <laughs> My wife, actually, I met her in Jerusalem and led her to the Lord in Jerusalem, then we got married. It was the season for arranging marriages. It's against this background, again, as the Song of Solomon is read, when the Messiah comes for his bride. And it shall come again, like the bride of the Song of Solomon, It'll be either the worst nightmare or the best dream. Now, we have to understand what Passover really means. Coming out of Egypt. Egypt is a figure or a metaphor for the world. Pharaoh was a figure of the devil, the god of the world. The way that Moses went to a mountain and made a covenant with blood and sprinkled it on the people is the way that Jesus goes to a mountain and makes a covenant with blood and sprinkles it on us. As we read in 1 Corinthians 10, our fathers, my brethren, went through the water just as Moses led the children of Israel through the water out of Egypt into the promised land is the way that Jesus leads us out of the world through baptism into heaven. That's the looking back. But then there's the looking forward. The judgments on Egypt are recapitulated in the book of Revelation. The darkness, the smiting of the waters, all of this. The way that Pharaoh's magicians 
counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron is the way the Antichrist and false prophet will counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. The way that Moses said the children of Israel to leave Egypt, Matthew 24, 45, the good and faithful servants will feed God's people to prepare them to leave this world. There'll be a final feeding, like a last supper of God's people. And they'll be given understanding of his words. As in Daniel, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. The coming out of Egypt is a type of our salvation, but it's ultimately a type of the rapture and resurrection of the church. That's why they had to bring Joseph's bones with them out of Egypt, because the dead in Christ will rise first. Now together. We look back, but we look forward. Now the Exodus begins in Exodus chapter 1. Verse 8, now a new pharaoh, or a new king, arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He did not know Joseph. Joseph is a type of Jesus as we saw in the first session, right? In Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You will bruise him in the heel, he will bruise you in the head. Now be careful of restorationists who are, or kingdom now people who are telling you that that means we're going to conquer the world for Christ. It is not the woman who conquers the world, it's the seed of the woman, the Messiah. In Romans, the Lord of glory will trample the serpent under your feet. Kevin Connor and these guys have it all wrong. They're taking the thing out of total context to support their own restorationist ideas. The woman Eve represents Israel before she does the church. But it's the seed of the woman. The serpent persecutes the woman. The devil. Anti-Semitism and persecution of the church may be accurately described as a coin with heads and tails, two sides of the same coin. You can distinguish between anti-Semitism and persecution of the church, but you can't separate them. Who were the two kinds of people most persecuted by the communists before the Iron Curtain came down in the Soviet Union? Born-again Christians and Jews. Go to Speaker's Corner in London and find out who the Muslims hate the most. Born-again Christians and Jews. Who are the two kinds of people most persecuted for centuries by the Roman Catholic Church? Born-again Christians and Jews. It was a pharaoh who did not know Joseph who began to persecute the Jews. Now remember, he's a type of Jesus. Gentiles who know Joseph, non-Jews who know Jesus, will tend to be philo-Semitic. Gentiles who don't know Jesus will tend to be anti-Semitic. Understand? Let's continue. They had to eat the Passover with bitter herbs. Zechariah 12.10 I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so they will look upon me who they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. What happened? They see the one who comes back as the son of David was also the son of Joseph. You understand? One Messiah, two coming. The Talmudic literature goes to extravagant lengths to try to reconcile these two pictures of the suffering servant and the conquering king. They had to take the blood from the trowel with his stop and put it on the cross, on the door in the form of a cross. A, a cross of blood, a bloody cross on the door. Of course, this goes, with the sheep being sacrificed, it goes to John 10, about Jesus saying that he's the one who came for the sheep and he's the door and so on. Now, there was no time to prepare the food. It had to be ready, and they had to eat it in haste with their sandals on and their staffs in hand. When Jesus comes, it'll be the same thing. 
Remember the Last Supper? Quick, let's go quickly. When he comes back, it'll be the same thing. Just think of the foolish virgin. Well, give us some of your oil. They should be getting the oil now. When the time comes and they need the oil to turn the lamps up to see in the dark, they're not going to have any. They're going to come to try to get it from us. But what do the wise virgins say? There's no time. They've not been fed the right food. Even the people who have it have to eat it in haste. We should be into the Bible, learning it backwards and forwards. It says in Daniel and Revelation, seal these things up for the time of the end. There is no new revelation in the Bible. There is only a clearer and a better understanding of things already in it. Be careful of people who tell you they've got the great mysteries of Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation figured out. Daniel was told, seal these things up for the appropriate time. God will show at the appropriate time. You know what? God is already beginning to show. And one of the ways God is going to show is what it says in Romans 11. If their rejection, that is the Jews, be the reconciliation of the world, what will their reconciliation be but life from the dead? God is going to bless the church through Jewish people before Jesus comes back. As Paul says, to them belongs the oracles of God. When you understand the Bible midrashically, the way the Jews looked at it in the time of Jesus, it's very different than what you see now. We have Western grammatical historical exegesis which only takes you so far. On Palm Sunday, the singing Hosanna, and they tell Jesus to tell the people to remain silent. Jesus said, if these remain silent, the stones will cry out. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You are the stones, living stones, being built together into a holy house of the Lord. Stones of the temple. Christians are the stones. So on Palm Sunday, midrashically, the big Herodian stones, if you come with me to Jerusalem, I'll show you, the bigger than the stones of the pyramids, they're saying, tell him to be quiet. And he's drawing on the background of these big stones. And he says, the stones will cry out. Who are the stones of the temple? Christians. Peter, first Peter 2, 5. In other words, if the Jews don't proclaim him, the Christians will. You understand? That's Midrash. The whole Bible's like that. When you begin reading the Bible as a Jewish book instead of as a Greek book, you're going to see a lot more than you presently see. Before Jesus comes back, that's going to happen. As the natural branches are grafted in, eventually, that's going to affect the way the church looks at the Bible. And these things that have been hidden since the apostles are going to be made manifest. Now be careful of Gnosticism. That's something else. We'll talk about that in the third session. There's no new revelation, only an understanding of what's already in there that will get deeper and clearer. Seal these things up to the appropriate time. Now let's continue. They couldn't break any bone. Bones have to do with the structure of God's law, of God's word. And of course, when Jesus hung on the cross, he was the word incarnate. They couldn't break any of his bones. They broke the legs of one thief, then the other, but the one criminal, then the other, but they couldn't break his. Nonetheless, let's look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. The Roman Catholic Church is a false religious system, but it understands the sanctity of communion better than other people do. No leaven. They say it's a mortal sin if you take the Lord's Supper unworthily with mortal sin. Sacrilege. And they're right. We should never allow unsaved people to take it. And I would argue very strongly from Scripture, we shouldn't allow unbaptized people to take it. The Plymouth Brethren probably have the most biblical view of the Lord's Supper there is. One body broken. We're one body. 
It's the center of their idea of fellowship, communion, and worship. It's central to it. And it should be for us the same. In Jude's epistle, we're told that people who take the Lord's Supper unworthily are blemishes on our agapes, on our love feasts. Let's look at Exodus 12, verses 25 to 27. And it will come about when you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, that you shall observe this right. And it will come about that your children will say to you, what does this right mean? That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of Israel, the monkey mob of the angel of death, in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes, and the people bowed low. And they worship. And then in chapter 13, verse 8, you shall tell your son, it's because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. God's judgment is coming. Only those who have the blood of the Lamb are spared from it. Normally, what we would do in most of our churches when we take the Lord's Supper is we send the children out to nursery school or something like that. That's a mistake. Long before the advent of modern educational psychology, God's Word tells us children learn by imitating their parents, and they learn from object lessons. What's the meaning of this right? It's because of what the Lord did for me when he brought me out of Egypt. Children are curious. They want to ask their parents questions. Why are you doing this? Why can't I have it? Well, you can't have it because it's only for those who are believers who have come out of Egypt. In our family, our son is not baptized yet, but we do think he's saved. But we're going to have him baptized. Our daughter is a baptized believer, my wife, myself. My son Eli comes and he watches the Lord's Supper. And my wife takes it and I take it and his sister takes it. He doesn't take it. He feels I'm being left out. This is my family, but somehow I'm not a part of my own family. He's supposed to feel he's not a part of his own family. The children of believers are somehow temporarily sanctified through the faith of their parents so they can make their own decision, but he's got to make his own decision. He's supposed to feel left out. Abba, why are you doing that? It's because of what the Lord God did for me when he took me out of Egypt. Abba, why are you doing that? It's because of what Jesus did when he took me out of the world. We should let our children see it. Let them learn from it. Let them desire it. No Gentiles were to take the Lord's Supper. Never let an unsaved person take it. Now there's no further record of them taking the Passover again until they get to Joshua chapter 5, verse 5. Why? Moses represents Jesus in his first coming, Joshua in his second coming. Jesus' name, Yeshua, is simply a post-captivity way of saying Joshua, Yehoshua. Also, Moses represents the law. Jesus represents the gospel. Joshua represents Jesus. The law can't lead you into the promised land, into heaven. Only grace can. But they do it in Egypt, then they do it again in heaven. What does Jesus say? To proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every major revival that we have a record of in the Old Testament, Ezra's revival, Hezekiah's revival, Josiah's revival, every one was characterized in the history of Israel by massive Passover celebrations. They'd always have to go back to the blood of the Lamb. Unless there's a radical return to the purging of leaven and the blood of the Lamb, there will never be a revival. Like in the book of Ezra, Ezra wept. Revivals don't begin by people laughing, they begin by people weeping. I don't care what kind of lies you're reading about in these magazines of the Toronto stuff. Signs and wonders don't bring revival. What happens? They have their place, these signs follow. Despite seeing the signs and wonders and miracles did, a week later the same people were yelling, crucify him. Unless there is a radical return to the purging of leaven, and the blood of the land, there will never be a revival. Like in the book of Ezra, Ezra wept. 
Revivals don't begin by people laughing, they begin by people weeping. I don't care what kind of lies you're reading about in these magazines of this Toronto stuff. Signs and wonders don't bring revival. What happens? They have their place. These signs follow. Despite seeing the signs and wonders and miracles did, a week later the same people were yelling, crucify him. And they're trying to tell you that signs and wonders are the key to revival. And how come they weren't the key to, to the revival in Jesus' day? They killed him. Every real revival in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, was characterized by a radical return to Passover, to the blood of the Lamb. Do you see the emphasis on purging the leaven, getting rid of pride, sin, false doctrine, and going back to the blood of Jesus? Is that what's being preached today? No, people are laughing hysterically. The Holy Spirit in the Bible is worshipped in the context of the Trinity. He's worshipped in the context of the triunity of the Godhead, that's all. Where is the Holy Spirit ever prayed to directly in the Bible? Nowhere. He's only worshipped in the context of the triunity. Come Holy Spirit, let your fire fall, that's not scriptural. Good morning Holy Spirit, that's not scriptural. The Holy Spirit is a servant of God, he's God, but he always points people to Jesus. It's not even biblical. What you see going on today is just not biblical. Every revival was characterized by a return to the theme of the blood of the Lamb. There was no emphasis on that in Toronto. No emphasis on that in Kansas City. None. Come on. But let's look further. In the time of Jesus, of course, they would sing... The Halal Rabbah, as we looked at in our first session, Psalm 113 to 118. But it was a pilgrim feast, a psalm of ascent. We always say in Hebrew, we're going up to Jerusalem. La Alot. It doesn't matter if you approach it from the north, the south, the east, or the west. We always say we're going up to Zion, going up to Jerusalem. Psalm 122. I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Let's go up to Zion. Let's go up to Zion. Always going up. A psalm of ascent. There'd be seven days of ritual purification. And it would be a time again, as we looked at, when famous rabbis would debate, as Jesus did with the Pharisees and Sadducees. But it was also a time when servants had the right to remain in the service of their masters. God did not allow slavery for the Jews. They had something called indenturism. You could be a bond servant who'd be free at the year of Jubilee. God didn't believe in slavery. You'd be free. You'd be legally obligated to work for somebody for a time, but then you'd be free. But you had the option of remaining in their service. And at Passover, you would formalize it by having a gold ring, gold nail driven through your ear into a doorpost. Jesus calls us his bond servants, not his slaves. We choose it. And it happens at Passover. Again, as we talked about this morning, they would have to inspect the lamb for one of up to 73 or 74 different defects. Finding no defect on a lamb, they would sacrifice it. With Jesus, the Sanhedrin put him on trial. Finding no defect in him, Pilate, Herod, could find nothing. They sacrifice. Normally, one lamb would be enough to feed anywhere from 10 to 20 people. Then they would have what was known as a seder. A seder meaning order. In the day of Jesus, a lot of customs that were acquired in the Babylonian captivity were incorporated into the seder, including eating at a table called the triclinium, three-sided table, and the people would recline only free men recline, not slaves. The lamb had its blood represented by wine, which they would mix with warm water to give it the, the texture or the, the, the appearance and the temperature of wine. We're also told in the Talmudic literature 
about the showbread that you read about in 1 Corinthians 11, that it corresponded to the body of the Lamb. The Talmud tells us that the matzah, the unleavened bread, corresponds, the showbread corresponds to the body of the, the body of the lamb, but it had to be striped and pierced. It had to be striped and pierced. As Jesus was pierced and striped. Again, they could not touch any dead body or they'd be ritually defiled. And the Passover would have to be delayed. Now, if something is in Aramaic instead of Hebrew, that tells us it goes back to the Second Temple period, the time of Jesus. The time of Jesus in Judaism is called the Second Temple period. And if you find something in Aramaic, it means it's something that was around it from his time. And you say a prayer when you do the Bedichat Chamet, the search for leaven. This is what Paul was drawing on, of course, in 1 Corinthians. Throw out the old leaven. Well, today, every Friday night, a Jewish family has a miniature Passover with challah and with wine. The early Christians had a Passover called an agape, a love feast, in Jude once a week. Every time we remember the Lord, the mini is the Passover. And you begin by lighting Shabbos candles. Usually the wife and mother lights the candle. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. You call it Kiddush, making it holy. Then you'd have four cups at Passover. For the Passover feast, you would have four cups. Two of these cups are mentioned in the New Testament accounts of the Last Supper, but altogether... There are actually four of them. The first of these four cups is called the cup of sanctification. The second cup, the third cup, and the fourth cup play out the Passover ritual. The Mishnah teaches that according to two authorities, Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Benaiah, these four cups correspond to the four verbs in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, describing God's redemption. I will bring you out, deliverance, I will deliver you, I will redeem you, and I will take you to be my people. Now there's also a fifth cup, which you set. We call that Elijah's cup. You actually set a place at the table for Elijah. And when your children are very small, you take a sip of the wine from the cup of Elijah, and you send your son to see if Elijah is coming. And when he's gone, you sip the wine and say that Elijah's been here and gone and you missed him. They understood from the book of Malachi that Elijah would have to come before the Messiah. So the year when Elijah comes to the Passover Seder is the year when the Messiah would show up. And normally Orthodox Jews would be tremendously adverse to having images. But at Passover, they'll actually put one out as Melchizedek, Marquisedek. The reason being that Melchizedek is a type of Jesus, and some would say a Christophany, an Old Testament manifestation of it. Then you take three pieces of matzah, which are again striped and pierced. And you have this as embroidered. It says, La Kavod Hag Hamatzot, in honor of the feast of matzah or unleavened bread. And there are three chambers. The rabbis tell us it corresponds to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac is the center one, and Isaac is, of course, a type of Jesus on the altar. And he's given back by figure and resurrection, as Paul describes it. It can also be understood messianically as corresponding to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be that as it may, you put a piece of matzah in each. You would also have a container with some salt water corresponding to the tears shed by the Egyptians. Then on a Seder plate, you'd have the following. You would have something called 
Karoset. Karoset. Karoset is made from nuts, apples, cinnamon, and rot wine. It's been crushed together to look like mortar that the bricks were made to make bricks for Pharaoh. And that's what unsafe people are doing. They're making bricks for Pharaoh. Then you have bitter herbs called maror, maror, to induce tears. They had to eat the Passover with bitterness to remind them about the suffering they had in Egypt, as we should be reminded about the world. We'll come to that in a moment. Then there was chazeret, which is the root of radish. Again, another bitter herb. And then there was karpas, usually parsley, that you used to dip corresponding to hyssop, as in Psalm 51, when King David says, purge me with hyssop, it has to do with applying the blood, and you dip it into the tears and so on. Then you have something called zro'ah, the bone, Repre bone of a lamb, representing the lamb. The reason being this, the Passover was a perpetual ordinance, but without a temple, without a high priesthood, the Jews cannot celebrate the Passover. They eat the Passover now, usually with poultry, keeping a bone on the Seder plate to remind them of the lamb. While Messianic Jews, Jewish believers, will eat lamb, because they can say, we still have a high priest, his name is Yeshua. We still have a temple, the body of Christ, we can keep the Passover. As Paul says, we establish the Torah. The Jewish religion you see today is not the Jewish religion of the Torah. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins in Leviticus 17, as the Septuagint translates it. Once the temple was destroyed in fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel and Jesus, they had to invent another religion. Much the same as Roman Catholicism is not the Christianity of the New Testament, or liberal Protestantism is not the Christianity of the New Testament. Neither is rabbinic Judaism the Judaism of the Torah. It's a different religion which has replaced the temple with the synagogue, has replaced the Levites and the Levitical priests, the Kohanim, with the rabbi and so on, and has replaced what God ordained, much of it with tradition. So they commemorate the fact and acknowledge the fact that their religion is not the religion Moses gave them by the fact that they're eating it with poultry instead of with lamb, which they remember. On the roof of every Orthodox synagogue, you'll find the word Ikavod, Ikabod, the glory has departed. Then there is something called a betza, a roasted egg. It's the traditional Jewish food of mourning. The Jews would sit shiva in the diaspora, they would eat a roasted egg. That's the state of place. This first cup is the cup of sanctification. You pour it, and after a reading and some prayers, you drink it. The first thing that happens in coming to the Lord's table is sanctification, being made holy. There must be a purging of leaven and a consecration unto God. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri HaGefen, Amen. Then you take the middle wafer, which is again striped and pierced, and you break it. So now it has become striped pierced, and broken. With one portion, you make a sandwich called the korach of bitter herbs, designed to invoke tears. The other is wrapped up and hidden in a napkin, and it's placed under the tablecloth, and we call this burying it. So it's striped, it's pierced, it's broken, then it gets wrapped in a napkin and placed under the tablecloth, which they call burying it. With the other, you make this sandwich of bitter herbs called 
Korah. After this, you go to the second cup. The second cup is called the cup of deliverance. And it's part of a four-part question. Why is this night different from every other night? And the father sings the questions to his children, and they answer them back. Again, it's a way to teach your children. You sing the questions, and then the children have to sing back the answers. Why is this night different from every other night? Every other night, we eat, we, we don't eat with bitter herbs. Tonight, we eat with bitter herbs. And so on, and so on, and so on. Why is this night different from every other night? Be that as it may, it's a time when the children learn the songs, and through learning the songs, they learn the theology or the doctrinal meaning of the Passover. Other nights, we may eat any kind of herbs. Tonight, we eat bitter herbs. Other nights, we do not dip even once. Tonight, we dip twice, parsley into salt water like the tears, and later on, bitter herbs into haroset. Other nights, we eat sitting or reclining. As we please, tonight, we should all recline. And you go through this with the second cup, again, which you call the cup of deliverance. Ma nishtana halai la chaze mi kol halelot, mi kol halelot, de bakol halelot, anu achrim shayan yarakot, shayan yarakot, halai la chaze, halai la chaze kulo maro, halai la chaze, halai la chaze maro. Every other night, we eat what we wish, but tonight, the herbs must be bitter. When you take the bread for the Korach, you say another prayer in Aramaic. It's still in the Sephardic, the Eastern Jewish Haggadah. This is like the bread of affliction that our fathers ate in the wilderness. It uses the language of analogy. It is the prayer what Jesus would have said when he gets into this is my body. That kind of thing. That's the background of the Passover. The Roman Catholic Church has to take John chapter 6 out of all reasonable context about eating my body and drinking my blood to justify transubstantiation. The context of John 6 was one where Jesus was saying, he is the antitype. He's the fulfillment, the meaning of the manna that fell from the wilderness in heaven. The Passover had to be celebrated in Jerusalem. It was a pilgrim feast. In John 6, it was not yet Passover, and they were not in Jerusalem, they were in Galilee. So John 6 is not even talking about the Lord's Supper in a primary sense. It's an indirect reference to it, but it's not a primary reference to it. It did not happen at Passover time, and it did not happen in Jerusalem. That manna is not the manna of the Last Supper. You understand? For John 6 to be about the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, it would have had to be about the Last Supper, meaning it would have had to happen in Jerusalem at Passover, and it didn't. The context doesn't allow what the Roman Catholic Church does with it. Nonetheless, when you read the prayer, this is like the bread. It uses the language of analogy. When you understand the Jewish background of the Passover, there is no possible way you can arrive at the doctrine of transubstantiation. When you say that the bread and wine becomes Jesus incarnate, then you worship it, that's idolatry. And then you eat it, that's cannibalism. Cannibalism and idolatry, it's not biblical, it's not Christian, it's not Jewish, it's not anything, it's pagan. Let's continue. After the second cup, you begin filling the cup of God's wrath with ten drops corresponding to the judgment that God brought against Egypt. And again, these are partially replayed in the book of Revelation before Jesus comes. One a type of the other. Blood, dam, frogs, fadaya, mats, kinim, scatter beetles, aro, pestilence, daibar, boils, jachin, hell, barad, locusts, arbe, darkness, choshek, the slaying of the firstborn, 
Makat Bechorot. And it's like a cup getting filled up. Like in Revelation, the cup of his wrath gets filled up. After this, the father tells the story. And the story, the telling of the Exodus story can take up to three hours. In it, there are two highlights. One is the story of the sons, the four sons. The background to the four sons takes place in Mark's Gospel, as it's played out in the New Testament. The four sons are the Hacham, the wise one. He associates himself with his family's worship of God. The wicked son is the Rasha, who disassociates. The simple one, perhaps the innocent one, is called the Tom, the son who could put the best, who he might be the best of all of them. He requires an honest, straightforward, reasonable answer. And then finally, there's the Shei Anyo the Dei Elishor, sort of like the shy or the tongue-tied one, who simply bliss and just doesn't know. This is played out, the four sun pattern is played out at Passover time, in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17, when the people ask questions of him. They're asking the questions that you would ask at the Passover from the Father and the Seder. The highlight then, after this, becomes singing of the song Dayenu, meaning it would have been enough. If all he did was bring us out of Egypt, that would have been enough. If all he did was give us the Torah, that would have been enough. And to this, Messianic Jews, Jewish Christians, add further verses. If all he gave us was the New Testament, that would have been enough. If all he gave us was the Messiah, that would have been enough. If all he gave us was the Holy Spirit, that would have been enough. Ilu hoti hoti enu hoti anu mi mitraim hoti anu mi mitraim daenu dae daenu dae daenu dae daenu 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 dae daenu dae daenu dae daenu 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 ilu naten naten lanu naten lanu etatora naten lanu etatora daenu dae daenu dae daenu Dai dainu, 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 etc. If all he gave us was the Torah, that would have been enough. If all he gave us was the land, that would have been enough. And it keeps going on telling people how wonderful God is. Now look at Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, please. The robber who among them had greedy desires, and the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and garlic. But now our appetite is gone, and there's nothing for us to look at except this nana. In other words, Egypt is the world. Oh, I remember what it was like before I was saved. I remember the things I had in the world. I remember the motorcycles and the Pink Floyd records and the cocaine and the girlfriends in university. Now there's nothing for me to look at except this manna, the rabble. The flesh, the old nature, longs for Egypt. Unsaved people are making bricks for Pharaoh. We forget we were slaves in the world before we were saved, when we long for the things of the world. Then you sing the beginning of the Hallel Rabbah, as they did to Jesus on Palm Sunday, Psalm 113 to 114, and then the third cup of wine is poured. This is the cup of blessing and redemption. You then have a ceremonial washing. The servant normally does it, but what happened with Jesus was remarkable. The host became the servant when he washed the apostles' feet. Understand what it means, washing each other's feet. Peter says, not just my feet, but all the rest of my body as well. Jesus said, you don't need the rest of your body clean. Just your feet. Why? Because our feet are what comes in contact with the world. Every time we meet to take the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper should be the center of our worship and fellowship, being one body, it should be a little foretaste of what heaven will be like when we gather together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It should be a little foretaste of what heaven's going to be like. You understand? Out there's the world, in here's the marriage supper of the Lamb. A little hope. It's a little appetizer of where we're going. But what churches normally do is 
they set up a big coffee urn and have a time of fellowship after they take the Lord's Supper. That's a mistake. We need to refresh each other from our contact with the world before we take the Lord's Supper. What kind of week did you have? I had a crummy week. Well, that's all right. What kind of week did you have? I had a good week. You just think about it. You could be on your way to church in a traffic jam, and there's a big glory in front of you causing you to be late to get to church, and the pressures of the week are still on your mind, right? And the minute you set your foot in the door and you hear the Lord being worshipped, you feel like you've left one world and set your foot into another, don't you? Because you have. This is a little foretaste of where we're going. We need to refresh each other, have a time of fellowship before we take the Lord's Supper, not afterwards. You can do it afterwards if you want, but do it before. Don't send the kids out. Let them see it. And wash each other's feet before we come to the Lord's table. Out there's the world. It's only our feet that needs to be cleaned. What comes in contact with the world? The third cup. Now, let's go further. The meal is preceded by a stop. You would take it, the piece of matzo, and you would then dip it. And the host would give it to somebody who he wishes, wished to show favor to. Who did Jesus give it to? To Judas. Judas is a backslider, right? He went out from among us. Every backslider, before you reach, before a backslider reaches the point of no return in Hebrews 6 or Hebrews 10, where they will seemingly blaspheme the Holy Spirit, shall have one last final encounter with Jesus. He leaves the 99 for the one. He says to Judas, I know you've been scheming. I know you've been stealing. I know you've been planning to betray me. I know everything you've done. But instead of giving this stop to John, who's reclining on my chest, who loves me, or to Peter, who would follow me, I'm giving it to you, who betrayed me. I don't say it's not possible for somebody to backslide irretrievably and lose their salvation. I don't say. Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10 persuades me it is possible. And I've seen it happen to people. On the other hand, it's a hard thing to do when you have a Messiah who loves you that much, isn't it? Backslidden believers and very holy believers have something in common. Backsliders are under continual conviction of the Holy Spirit to repent, and very holy believers are always under conviction too, because the closer you get to the light, the more the dirt shows up. Now, Judas, Judas is the son of perdition. The only other person called the son of perdition is the Antichrist. Like the Antichrist, Judas was into money, and Judas is the only person, except for the Antichrist, the ultimate beast of Revelation, who was demon-possessed by Satan personally. Anytime you see something about Judas in the Bible, in either testament, because Judas is mentioned two or three times in the Old, three times in the Old Testament, he's referred to, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something about the Antichrist and how he'll be revealed. The way that Jesus revealed Judas. Look at the apostles. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? They didn't have any idea who it was until Jesus revealed him. If people can't see through the kinds of false prophets you have today, if they can't see through Toronto and all this stuff for what it is, and the vineyard for what it is, what's going to happen when the real deception comes? Let's continue. The third cup, then, is the cup of blessing. They drink it. But then they find the Afrikomene. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Is not this the cup of blessing? which we bless a sharing in the blood of the Messiah, is not the bread we break, a sharing in the body of the Messiah. The Afro-Kameen, then, is rediscovered. 
So it's taken out, it's striped, it's pierced, it's broken, it's buried, and then it's resurrected. It is with that that Jesus gives the first Lord's Supper, the first communion. Then they sing the rest of the Hallel Rabbah, Psalm 115 to 118. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, barach nuhem mi bet Adonai, kudula Adonai kitov kile olam chazdo. And then the fourth cup is poured. That is the cup of acceptance. You have to drink all four cups for the Seder to be complete. Judas had the first three. He defiled the Lord's table, among other things. But he didn't drink the cup of acceptance. Now, with this in view, let's go. Then, at that, then the family will say, Yerushalayim, may we all be free next year in Jerusalem. In this light, let's look at the Last Supper as a Passover Seder. Luke 22, 17-18. And when he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of my Father comes. That is the first, that is the Kiddush cup, the sanctification. I will not drink it until I drink it with you in the kingdom of my Father. What does Jesus say? How I've longed to eat the Passover with you. But I say to you, I will not break this bread or drink this cup until we do it in my father's house. Isn't that what he said? Pay attention. When somebody's going to die, and they know they're going to die, they don't spend time talking about the pop charts or the football scores. They spend time talking about and thinking about the things that are most important and spending time with the people who are closest to them. Jesus was no different. What Jesus did was, he said, I'm going to die. But the same as we break this bread and drink this cup now, even though I'm going to die, we're going to break this bread and drink this cup again in my father's house. You see, because the church has taken a Jewish religion and made it into a, if you want to call it a religion, a Jewish faith and made it into a Hellenistic one, it's misunderstanding the whole point. How does God, or what did God ordain for us to face death as Christians, the death of a loved one? If you're here with your husband or your wife or one of your parents or your children, unless Jesus comes first, the reality of death is going to be you sooner or later. The way you minister to a dying person to his family is you get your pastor, you come to the person's deathbed or whatever, and you do what Jesus did. I may die. You may die. But because of what Jesus did for us, the same as we break this bread and drink this cup now, we're going to break this bread and drink this cup a billion and a trillion years from now. That's the way that Jesus ordained to deal with the death of a loved one, impending death. If you're a pastor of a church, you have a loved one who's a Christian who's facing death, if you're facing death, that's what you should do. You get your family, your friends, your pastor, you take the Lord's Supper. And you say, no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to you, the same as we do it now, we're going to do it again. Because of what Jesus did for us. You'll see the spiritual and psychological benefits and encouragement that provides to the family, to the person. Even, it even makes the funeral easier. We're going to do it again. So let's continue. The first washing of hands, John 13, 4 and 5. He rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself about. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet 
and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. That's the ablaze of first washing. The broken pieces of bread are dipped in herbs and horoset and handed to all. John 13, 26. Jesus therefore answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And then in 27 and 30, what you do, do quickly. And in verse 30, so after receiving the morsel, he went out and immediately it was night. I can't explain it now. It's on the Antichrist page. But after Jesus reveals the Antichrist, that's when the real darkness of the tribulation begins. You can understand the son of perdition being revealed. Immediately it was night. If I die tonight or you die tonight, Jesus came for us. We should always live our lives like Jesus can come any day. But the resurrection and, and, and the rapture of the church won't happen until the Antichrist has been revealed to the faithful. He must be revealed in Thessalonica. That day will not come until the apostasia, the falling away, comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now there will be many Antichrists and many false prophets but one ultimate one, and he's going to be much more sophisticated and slicker than the other ones. And again, if people can't see through the obvious false prophets you have in the church today, what are they going to do in this guy? Let's continue. <coughs> the blessing after meals, then. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 24. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the night in which Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Greek word is anamnesis, literally that you may not forget me. Then there's the blessing after the third cup. Verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 11. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. After that, they take the third cup, and they finish, and the hallel would be recited, and the fourth cup would be taken, and they'd have a closing hymn. Matthew 26, verse 30. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That's, they would have finished singing the Halal Rabbah. After supper, in Matthew 26, verse 26, this is what we read. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. That was the Afrokamin. It was rediscovered after the meal. That's the point of the Seder ritual when you take it out. That's what he used. What was striped, pierced, broken, buried, and resurrected. Third cup. And the, the first cup and the third cup are the two mentioned. The cup of redemption and the cup of blessing was mentioned in the Passover Seder. And then, again, Tanah Haba Be'erushalayim. Next year with Jerusalem, may we all be free. Jerusalem above, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's what happened at the Last Supper. Those principles should always be for us when we take the Lord's Supper. No Gentile, never let an unsaved person take it. It was for those who came through the water. I wouldn't even let an unbaptized person take it. Purge the leaven. Before we take the Lord's Supper, we need to confess our sins. Wash each other's feet. We need a time of fellowship before we come to the Lord's table, because out there is the world our feet have come into contact with it. Don't send the kids out. Let them see it. Let them learn from it. Why do you do that? Because of what God did for me when he saved me. 
and unless the Lord comes first, if you go to be with him by the normal way instead of being rapid, you're a Christian, take the Lord's Supper with your family, with your loved ones. Well, I long to eat the Passover with you, but I say to you, I will not eat it with you again until we eat it in the kingdom of my Father. It's a little taste of eternity. And we come together, the same as we break the bread and drink the cup now, that's what we're going to be doing in heaven. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. God bless you. Tanah Habab Yerushalayim.